Um, good morning to most of you, and certainly for those in, in Australia, good afternoon, or good day, as you say. So um, we're going to, uh, it's, it's a fairly intense uh, presentation, because there's a lot of, lot of different concepts, a lot to get through, but it's actually, I've tried to simplify, simplify it as much as possible. Um, this is the picture of our, our campus at sunset. Yeah, I was working late that day when I took that photo, and there's me uh, just in the uh, window up here looking down on all of you. So the first thing we really need to do is to make sure we understand some terminology. <clears throat> um, cognition. Now, cognition really is a, is a term referring to the mental processes involved in gaining knowledge and comprehension. It's, it's all about thinking. Co cognition is thinking. And we're engaging in cognition right now, of, of course. I um, mean, all of these different terms are associated with cognition, knowing, awareness, perceiving, um, conceiving, remembering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Metacognition is the conscious awareness of one's cognitive processes. This is where you've made a decision, or you're about to make a decision, and you're thinking, is this decision, but is it is it a robust decision? What's it based on? And that's called metacognition. Meta memory. Well, meta memory first is a part of metacognition. It's about how robust are your memory traces. I remember something, but how strong is that memory? Am I willing to say I remember 100% that this is the case? Well, maybe not. But the process of trying to uh, um, explain or trying to quantify your memory is called meta memory. Uh, team-based learning. Now, team-based learning is an educational approach in which activities involving a collaborative learning, and it requires groups of students to, walk, to work towards shared goals. It was originally formulated by uh, Larry Michelson, who's here in this picture, and there's me skulking at the back. Um, and this was, in, uh, this was at a, uh, a meeting in, in Sharjah, which is in the UAE. So first looking at the team-based learning protocol. Well, the team-based learning protocol, it starts out with individual study, which we'll look at all of these in, 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 uh, in their own space soon. Individual study, it starts out with outside the classroom. And then in the classroom, we have an individual test, which is testing on your understanding of what you've learned in the individual study. After that, we have a group test, which I'll explain uh, what that really means later. Then there's an appeal process, a class review, a team application is in the application phase, so it's the second session. The application phase, which we'll also look at the details of in a moment, and reporting and discussion, which we'll also look at forthwith. So firstly, in the initial learning process, this pre-reading process, the subject which is going to be covered uh, covers all the prerequisite knowledge to understand a clinical case which the students will encounter in the application phase later on. So it's looking at all that prerequisite knowledge which they require to understand the basic premise and to kind of get them get the ball rolling within that application phase so they're not completely lost. Um, a specific subject related to a particular clinical case, it's uh, learned typically through pre-reading either or a lecture or online activities or perhaps all of them. Students uh, study materials in preparation for this TBL session and they will be tested on what they've learned in this pre-reading within the uh, individual, the IRAT, Individual Readiness Assurance Test and the GRAT or TRAT, it's either group or team readiness assurance test. So students first will study materials in preparation for the TBL session. All study will be conducted outside the classroom. That doesn't mean they can't sit inside the classroom and read their books, of course. Um, students re uh, receive a list of learning activities and materials. So you're actually trying to guide the learning so they, it's very much specific, ultimately, so they understand the premise and the uh, uh, many of the components of the clinical case they'll be facing later. 
and also students receive a set of learning goals. So they know exactly what they have to study. They have the material, they have the learning goals. So they should be prepared for the next stage, which is the readiness assurance phase. Now, the initial learning from a cognitive viewpoint, here are lots and lots of different people. And according to cognitive constructivist principles, which is a learning theory, which is, it probably best describes how we learn as, as adults, as uh, in, in, within complex learning, it describes how best we learn. Um, during pre-reading, every learner will try to interpret new material in terms of what they already know. Now you might think that you're giving uh, uh, some learning material to a student, they're learning like a blank slate. No, they're interpreting everything in terms of what they already know. And sometimes if their knowledge is erroneous, something wrong in what they've interpreted or what they've learned previously, they can interpret the new material also wrongly. They construct new knowledge in terms of the structures of knowledge which they already have. And because of this, interpretation and knowledge construction, when students are learning something, is highly individualized. People will learn things not in the same way. They will learn things in a very much individualized way. Now, here's an example. This is where we have two subjects. Now, cognitive constructivism is represented here. These two individuals interpret new knowledge differently in terms of what they already know. Now, this part at the bottom here, the larger part constitutes long-term memory. This part here is working memory. And this part here is, refers to the components of something they're learning in real time. So as we can see with subject A, there's a lot of connections within their long-term memory. There are a lot of connections between what they've learned. They've built up a schema, a large schema of the things that they've learned. They've put it all together and the connections are robust. As we can see here, we have connections from this component to this and this to this, et cetera, et cetera. All the components, all the connections between components seem to be there. For subject B, we have a little bit of an issue. They've learned things in a slightly different way. And some of the context and concepts they've learned are not linked properly together. Now, in this case, this particular learner has some linkages between different concepts, but also there are some linkages which are missing. They don't know that, for instance, that this concept is linked to this concept. So these are missing. So this student, this learner has less of a knowledge base. And that will affect how they interpret new knowledge. So now looking at the individual test. The individual readiness assurance test is a quiz using multiple choice questions. Each individual student completes a, uh, completes a set of seven to 20 multiple choice questions. And the questions usually focus on concepts related to the clinical case in the application phase. So it's all retrospectively designed so that what you're covering in that clinical case, in the application phase, all those prerequisite, the prerequisite knowledge that you require to understand that, this is what they've learned in the pre-reading and what you're testing them on in the readiness assurance tests. This is an individual test. Now, readiness assurance questions, well, questions are usually focused on key concepts and mechanisms of action. Ideally, questions would be at a higher order rather than just recall. There's no point in testing them on recall, really. You want to ensure that they understand the basic concepts for that case, which comes later. From a cognitive viewpoint, the individual readiness assurance uh, test. Um, now, according again to cognitive constructivist principles, item responses and thus assessment data may reflect individualized ways of understanding learned content. As we can see, we have our two examples, subject A and subject B. Subject A has a very well-rounded knowledge. They will probably give better responses to the questions 
the subject B, who doesn't have some of those concepts, they don't understand, they haven't linked together some of those important concepts. Differences in the level of understanding of learned content between individuals would be expected. And also an inability to learn or remember content or context in some individuals. Now, learning is all based around schema. And if we have strong, robust schema, which different concepts are linked together, something new which you've learned can easily fit in to this robust structure. But where you have an incomplete structure, it's actually much more difficult to learn within that structure and to fit new information into a structure which is incomplete. The individual readiness assurance test allows participants to formulate item responses. And when they do that, they're thinking through a way of answering each of those responses. <clears throat> they will use either heuristics or algorithms, uh, the algorithms which they might know or believe that they know. Now, what are these? We'll look at in a moment. Now, algorithms can 100% guarantee solutions. Of course, we don't have many of those in, in a clinical practice, but, but there, there is a, there's room for, for, for a, lot, a larger extent of use of algorithms within clinical practice rather than um, some of the scripts we're using currently. However, algorithms are a step-by-step -step procedure used when thinking to solve a problem. And this uh, schematic here, this flow chart describes an algorithm. You're making a decision on each of these points to arrive at a decision at the end, an end point decision. Working through an algorithm tends to be slow because we have to follow each step and move through that process. Incidentally, algorithms have nothing to do with Al Gore. Um, they were actually named after Al Ghorizmi, a ninth century mathematician, although he didn't invent them himself. So just so you're sure, Al Gore has nothing to do with algorithms. I'm not sure if he even knows any. Anyway, enough of that. So heuristics. Heuristics are efficient mental processes or mental shortcuts. Heuristics are kind of a shortcut on an algorithm. They help solve problems or learn a new concept. And a heuristic is a thought routine that will approximate a solution. It's like an alg algorithm with shortcuts. It's like an algorithm with all, out all the parts, without all the components within it. There's things missing. Algorithms, sorry, heuristics are fallible, which means you can make, definitely make mistakes in using heuristics. And some are more robust than others. Heuristics can be described as parts of an algorithm, but heuristics are often much faster to use than an algorithm to determine the solution. And here we have an example of a heuristics. What I did was I blurred out the middle part of the algorithm. This, this particular individual doesn't know the components in between, and they make an assumption between one point and another to get at their solution. I mean, this particular case, of course, there are two possible solutions from the starting point. So this is not a very robust algorithm. Cognitive strength is based in differences in knowledge structures. Now, in subject A, they have more complete knowledge and they may be thinking more in precise algorithms. Now, in subjects, something which is interesting and not explored that much in the literature is when we look at slow and fast thinking, well, a lot of these algorithms, and we'll look at that a little bit later, slow and fast thinking, um, a lot of these algorithms are uh, automated, become automated. So actually they become a part of an intuitive fast thinking later on, but that's another issue. So what we have here, subject A has more complete knowledge and may be thinking more in precise algorithms. Their knowledge is very complete and they're able to have a complete algorithm which they are working through to arrive at a decision about how do we organize this information in working memory and how are we going to fit it into long-term memory. But subject B has incomplete knowledge because they can't seem to link everything together to really understand what they're seeing. They'll make guesses in respect of what they do know. And that's really what a heuristic is. System one 
and system two thinking. Well, system one thinking, which was uh, Tversky and Kahneman's uh, work in the early, early 70s, um, system one thinking describes intuitive thinking. Now, this is where we're thinking automatically and quickly without any real effort. We're making decisions without any real effort. It seems to come intuitively. Uh, there's no sense of voluntary control. Um, heuristics are used principally in intuitive thinking. Reflective and ana analytical reasoning is the other system. There's attention paid to working through a problem, working through a problem and under conscious effort, finding the solution to that problem. This uses algorithms and robust heuristics under conscious effort. Why are we focusing on algorithms and heuristics? Well, the algorithms and heuristics will be used in the individual test to formulate answers to questions. But according to the constructivist theory of learning, um, we also have to uh, take account of the fact that algorithms and heuristics or the, the construction of learning is highly individual. So what we're going to have in our groups is that everyone is going to bring highly individualized heuristics and perhaps algorithms to that process and discuss them. So the next stage, a team rat, team members will bring their highly individualistic arguments and strategies to the discussion process. And these are based on their own knowledge of facts, algorithms, and heuristics. They're also based on their own knowledge of limitations, and the context of heuristics and the context of algorithms. So now we're looking at the group test. Well, firstly, the characteristics and tasks for teams in team-based learning. Teams must have two or more people. There's a coordination of activity among the members of the team required for attainment of the goal or objective. And of course, for a team, there needs to be a specific performance objective or recognizable goal has to be attained. That's what really constitutes a team. And this really is what we're doing in team-based learning. That's why it's not called group-based learning. What's the difference between a team and a group? Groups organize around individuals bringing together independent work in light of individual goals. And here's an example. They have an individual goal, but everyone's working independently to get through this wall. But teams organize around individuals bringing together coordinated work in light of collective goals. In TBL, teams are formed by a tutor in terms of an equal distribution of high performance, high, perf high, <laughs> high level performers, median performers, and lower performers in the previous assessments. In this case, we have five different individuals are put into this team, each within a different quintile in respect to their previous performance. A chapter in this book, this is quite a good book. I don't know about this particular chapter, but this book is pretty good. Um, a chapter in this book describes how TBL teams should be formed. Um, there are many uh, different demographic examples of how you would form a team, but the only two which have some evidence to back them up and are perhaps ethical are language proficiency and work experience. So if you have one member, within one group who has poorer language proficiency and one member who has some work experience. Some of the other criteria are weak and sometimes a bit odd. So I wouldn't take everything you read in that particular chapter as absolutely written in stone. Uh, what is the benefit to this method of team formation? Well, this will potentially mean that each team has one or more higher performers who may guide the lower performers, which is a good thing. And having team members having different experiences can offer different perspectives to the team. So it's quite good to uh, make sure a team has a kind of diverse population. Team readiness insurance test involves the same question set as in the individual test. The team must answer the same questions through a consensus building discussion. So they discuss what do we think the answer is as a team. They must produce an item response for each question through consensus. Also immediate feedback is important in allowing the team to know that they've made a mistake. So for instance, this particular group, they choose B 
in this particular question, which is incorrect. So they get another chance to answer it again. Now, before they answer it again, they're going to think about where they went wrong and revisit those issues and look at any faulty heuristics or algorithms which aren't appropriate and come up hopefully with the, the correct answer, which is D here, they inhibit cell division in all replicating cells. Um, this immediate feedback used to be conducted through the use of scratch cards, but this is a little bit archaic. You will find a lot of the literature they're using scratch cards. I wouldn't bother because now you can do this all computer-based and save yourself a little bit of money as well on these scratch cards. So now looking at the appeal process. The appeal process is where written appeals are used if a group disagrees with the class or the tutor's responses to questions in the readiness assurance phase. If uh, my group put B and it, the actual answer according to the tutor is D, then we might disagree, but we have to write why we disagree. What's the evidence for us disagreeing? Now, during that process of where we're looking for the evidence, we're actually learning something again. So it's actually very useful to have the appeal process. For written appeals, the group refers to pre-reading material and they must provide strong evidence for their assertion that this answer is wrong. The class reviewed it. This is the final stage of preparation before exploring the concepts in the clinical concept context, which is much more complex within the application phase. Question answers and their underlying concepts are clarified by the instructor and the most accurate problem solving strategies can be explored in discussion with the in instructor. The review class allows students to learn from their errors, both as individuals and as groups. Maybe their group made an error, maybe they made an error as an individual and they'll be able to learn from those errors. They will also learn where they went wrong and how ideally, how they went wrong. Um, they will also learn where they went wrong in their decision-making and why their metacognitive strategies failed. And we'll look at that in a, little, in a little while. The application phase. So the applica application phase questions usually involve assessment, interpretation of data, signs and symptoms related to a clinical case. And the questions are more focused on developing diagnostic reasoning. They're also more focused, of course, on application of knowledge in the clinical domain. Teams are challenged to make these interpretations and calculations, etc. And groups make a specific choice from a range of options. So usually we're having an MCQ, EMQ format or a list for students to select from. The uh, application phase structure follows the four S principles, a significant problem, same problem that all teams work on the same problem, a specific choice and simultaneous reporting. In, re in respect of the significant problem, students are presented with an authentic scenario, which is similar to something they would encounter in the workplace or may be foundational to the next level of study. And the answers must not, you, you should not be able to find those answers in any source, just looking up on the internet or in a textbook. It needs to be something which the students are going to need to be able to discuss to solve that problem. Um, how are we going to, well, what are the means of making a specific choice? I covered a little bit a moment ago, making a list or making a choice or making a specific choice. After the team has prepared its uh, responses to any question items, they post their choice simultaneously to the other teams exactly at the same time. So each of these teams here is saying, well, they think it's A and they think it's B, they think it's A and they think it's C. Now, this happens within a class discussion where all the students will discuss why they think it's A, why they think it's B or C. Teams must display their choices that are of a, for a particular question at a specific time, and everyone gets immediate feedback. Now, the open discussion in the classroom, if a group disagrees with the class or tutor's responses to questions in the application phase, is also useful it's like, a, it's like the um, appeal before. It's useful in having groups reconsider their responses. It allows an open discussion to unravel areas of difficulty, and it imparts the idea of wicked problems, which we'll look at a little bit later. What about learning in teams? Well, 
Collaborative learning can facilitate active learning where groups of students engage in and control and share the learning process. What does this mean exactly? Well, in lectures, knowledge is usually constructed passively and the structuring of knowledge is consumed passively. If you haven't, if you are like subject B, which we saw earlier, there are gaps in the knowledge. Well, some of what you're learning passively, you won't be able to fit into those gaps in, the, in that knowledge you have. So you won't be able to learn it so effectively. You won't be able to conceptualize what you've learned so effectively. After construction of knowledge, uh, sorry, active construction of knowledge allows formation in accordance with how knowledge is already structured in each individual. So passive construction, where you're receiving knowledge from an instructor in a specific way, according to a specific organization, is not as effective as active knowledge, where you are building your own knowledge in terms of what you already know, what you already don't know, and how knowledge is already structured within your long-term memory. So in teams, do participants learn collaborative skills? Well, it's unlikely. In fact, studies have shown no. Students or participants do not learn collaborative skills in teams. If they have the mindset of observing what they're doing wrong, then they can learn collaborative skills. So when we talk about team-based learning enables you to learn collaborative skills, well, the evidence shows it doesn't really. Collaborative cognition. This is another interesting concept. Collaborative cognition is defined as a cognitive activity that occurs when more than one individual are engaging in a collaborative, collaborative activity directed at solving a common task. It's like taking the cognition from an individual and through communication, spreading that cognitive process throughout the team. Group or collaborative cognition is assumed to dynamically emerge from the individuals in the group during the course of their interactions. There's a macro in teams model, which uh, uh, captures the kind of iterative process, which uh, an unfolds during collaborative cognition. We won't go into it, it's a little bit complex. Um, probably, I don't even understand it properly, just a little bit. Um, but one important thing within that particular model is knowledge held in each individual team member or by indi each individual team member that forms the basis of shared cognition is important. And this might include knowledge, not only about a problem domain, about a subject area, but also about members of the team and their competence or their skills, what you expect them to know or not know. Now, there's been quite a lot of work on collaborative, uh, a lot of work, a lot of research on collaborative memory recall. Now, collaborative memory research investigates the impact of collaboration on subjects, memory retrieval performance. And, and you would think, what if people were working in groups and well, that therefore they'd remember more because, well, simply because you're sharing information and we'll look at some of these in a moment. Now, memory outputs, is when knowledge is made explicit to the group. So you're saying, for instance, in this case, I remember this, that's a memory output. Now, this is discussed during collaborative memory retrieval, trying to remember something and it can serve as a reminder for otherwise forgotten items. So here we have in this, for these particular individuals, I remember this, says subject A. Oh yes, and I remember this now, plus for subject B. They've remembered that plus something else. And memory outputs is also used as a cue to retrieve additional items otherwise not retrieved. This is really what cross-queuing is here in this diagram. Memory outputs also provide feedback to correct retrieval errors. So if someone remembers something erroneously, like I remember this, are you sure because I remember this? Oh yes, you're right. So subject A here was incorrect in what they remembered. Subject B was correct. And subject A confirms that subject B was correct. And that's providing feedback to correct retrieval errors, which is called error pruning. So these are some potential advantages of collaborative learning and collaborative remembering. But also what's very well documented in the, in the literature is a phenomenon called collaborative inhibition. Collaborative memory studies show that remembering individually is more powerful than remembering as a group. If, if we take, for instance, the size of this circle in the middle of the screen, 
for collaborative group memory and the size of the circle for nominal group memory. This one, the nominal group memory is larger, which means they remembered more. Now here in collaborative group memory, everyone is trying to remember certain things about some event or something they've learned. But in this nominal group memory, what we're looking at are individuals learning. And then we look at what they learned in combination, but they're not working together. They're not working together in remembering. They're remembering by themselves. So when remembering by yourself, uh, uh, opposed to remembering as a group, you remember more when you remember by yourselves. These findings are explained by retrieval disruption. Now this arises from being exposed to others' outputs. And here we have an example in this diagram. This chap is remembering a certain organization. And this lady speaks and says, I think it's this. Now, as she does that, he loses what he was remembering. What he was remembering is disrupted by the other person's uh, interjection. Retrieval errors, <clears throat> retrieval errors made by and vocalized by one group member. So in this particular instance, we have one group member who remembered something incorrectly. These in a group can be transmitted to all the other group members by a process called social contagion. So here we have a retrieval error. This particular individual, he speaks about his he, what he remembers, which is incorrect. And this incorrect memory or conceptualization spreads to all of the members of the group. So we're having problems with groups now. Does this look good for TBL? Well, perhaps. Also, another thing which is often found is unbalanced group dynamics, where one group member dominates cognition and memory retrieval and the other group members kind of trust that person because perhaps they've shown success previously. On this occasion, they're wrong, but everyone agrees with them because they put them in a higher position. What about in problem solving tasks? So a lot of, a lot of evidence, a lot of research has been done on collaborative inhibition of memory, but can collaborative inhibition also be found in problem solving? Well, yes, it is. Um, one study by Noakes Malak et al. Um, in expert teams, problem solving in their area of expertise, sorry, in expert teams, problem solving in the area of expertise of those experts did not suffer from collaborative inhibition. So they're experts in a particular area and they didn't suffer from collaborative inhibition. They worked well as a team. But taking those same teams and getting them to solve problems, simple problems, outside their area of expertise, then the team members suffered collaborative inhibition, which means that they performed worse in groups than in, in, as individuals in solving the simple problems. This has been found in several other studies with non-expert groups that collaborative inhibition is also found in problem solving. How does this impact the team phases of TBL, also problem-based learning, case-based learning? Well, Collaborative inhibition is likely to occur in all of these. Few, few team members are experts. We can assume that. So because they don't have the expertise, the likelihood of collaborative inhibition in problem solving occurring is pretty high. There's also a potential for an unbalanced team dynamic to occur, which may persist in permanent team structures. What about if we were to allow team members to formulate ideas and retrieve memory traces ahead of any group discussion? Now, if you think about it, when nominal groups, they work better individually in remembering and problem solving, but collaborative groups, they work less well. So what if we allowed each individual member of that group or each member of that group as an individual to first try and solve the problem by themselves to generate those heuristics and those algorithms and try and solve it, and then come to the team. And what if we also allowed team members to record their ideas and record contents so and actually recording what they were thinking? Well, that would work pretty well, I would imagine, in overcoming collaborative inhibition. But why are there question marks here? Well, this hasn't been studied, strangely enough. And where would we find the opportunity to study this effect in TBL, because this is exactly what the readiness assurance phase in TBL does. 
Metacognition in team-based learning. Well, very little research has been conducted in this area, which is surprising. And this is my area of research. Metacognitive knowledge. This is an awareness of one's, one's strengths and weaknesses. We'll look at that a little bit in a minute. Metacognitive monitoring is another aspect of metacognition, which is an ability to monitor performance. So this is how, how you would assess your learning and performance during a task, how sure you are in a particular answer. Metacognitive control or regulation is something we can skip over at the moment. Well, metacognitive knowledge is the awareness of self. So how good is my retrieval of memory and robustness of memory traces? Maybe this person in my team has a better memory than me. Metacognitive monitoring is, are the algorithms or heuristics I'm using appropriate to this task? Maybe, maybe not. But the process of thinking about the appropriateness of your problem-solving strategies is metacognitive monitoring. Here we have an example in the individual readiness assurance phase. Team-based learning provides an opportunity for the initial individual readiness assurance phase for an individual to test a range of hypotheses in respect of any questions set, metacognitive monitoring. And in the individual phase, the individual student may test these heuristics and algorithms and whether they fit the problem. So firstly, this doesn't fit well. And this is better. He's another decision. This fits better. And well, this is best. This particular um, uh, algorithm or heuristic, this fits best to the problem. The individual phase tests a highly individualized understanding of pre-learned material. And this allows an individual to interpret in terms of what they already know. It's the heart of cognitive constructivism. So what you're going to find is when you have students in this individual phase, their understanding is very much individualized. So Richmond, uh, in 2007, suggested that immediate feedback students receive during TBL with, uh, within the uh, TRAT and GRAT may increase metacognitive awareness. So if you are getting feedback, immediate feedback in that team within team-based learning, uh, when you're doing the scratch card, hopefully not anymore, but you're using that scratch card, um, you're enabled, you're, this will enable you to see what, where you went wrong and where you perhaps went right. It will enable you to reconsider your answers in terms of this was a heuristic I chose to solve this issue, to solve this, this question, but it was wrong. So what is right? And you will start to change the way you're thinking about the use of heuristics. Um, how TBL teams can um, impact metacognition? Well, a group or team readiness assurance assessment pr provides the opportunity to discuss in small groups how they arrived at the answers they provided in the individual assessment. So they've already formulated some hypotheses, they've selected some algorithms or heuristics to answer questions in that first stage. Now they have the ability to discuss it with others. I think it's this because, I think it's this because they're discussing why they think this is a particular answer based on different mechanisms. Now, through discussion with other members of the group, they have the ability to defend what they're thinking, modify what they're thinking, expunge any heuristic or misplaced algorithm. Incorrect solutions may be questioned by other team members. And this is something very useful. Team members will also construct new knowledge in order to rule out incorrect solutions and rule in correct solutions. So in this case, this particular individual, I think I see where I went wrong. I should consider adding additional components next. So he's now changed his metacognitive strategy. The final stages of the readiness assurance and application phases, the class review is more tutor led. And this, albeit has considerable student interaction, is very useful, again, to reframe the robustness of those heuristics and, and algorithms which might be used and to modify metacognitive monitoring.
Now, this phase, in this phase, they will discuss the appropriate answers to each question and will focus on the most accurate heuristics or algorithms for solving questions. This provides a means of correcting thinking and metacognition, which include which occurred as individuals and or occurred within groups. Perhaps the whole group was thinking incorrectly, and this is where that erroneous thinking will be corrected. Where TBL might be effective in developing metacognitive abilities is where collaboration, uh, collaborative tasks engage learners in explicit discussion of cognitive strategies and errors, where they're both looking at different responses, I think it's this because, I think it's this because. Well, research has demonstrated that collaboration actually supports metacognitive awareness, particularly when you're discussing other metacognitive strategies other than your own. Now, metacognitive awareness is knowledge of your own metacognition or your own uh, base of knowledge. And knowing that people are thinking in different ways can change your metacognitive awareness which is quite a, a far ranging thing in, in respect of development of metacognitive skills in an individual. A very recent study by Maturasov and Mosa showed that TBL can help students improve in their ability to predict, predict their performance over multiple TBL sessions. So it looks like the process of TBL is improving metacognitive skills. Metacognitive knowledge improved over a semester. And this suggests that students were evaluating their learning during the process. Here we have this individual. Something's wrong in the way I'm trying to solve this problem. Well, she was correct. Maybe in a different problem, but she was correct. So he's thinking, she was thinking in this way. Ah, now this is how I should be thinking about this problem. And in fact, perhaps about other problems as well. So by engaging in conversation and discussion about how uh, the, the ideas that people have and how they're thinking and why they're thinking in that way can alter the thinking in this individual. And this is metacognition, which has been improved in this individual. An interesting uh, effect is the Dunning-Kruger effect. And this is where students at lowest performance levels tend to overestimate their abilities compared to high and mid-level performers. This was also found in the study by, by uh, Maturasov and Mosa. This was just October, 2020. Uh, students with the highest performance in TBL um, expressed underconfidence and students with the lowest performance expressed overconfidence. I've conducted some studies previously which have shown something even more interesting about a kind of divergence through the process, but that's, uh, we don't really have time for. Um, the amount of time studying, well, the same group found that students who reported they spent more time studying predicted they'd do better on assessments, but this wasn't actually correlated with actual performance. And it means that students perceive that the amount of time they spent studying wasn't correlated. Um, this has also been supported in other studies, but this is specific for team-based learning. So some of the disadvantages of team-based learning, well, team-based learning is difficult to implement there's an ongoing debate about its core features and the impact on its impact on performance. Um, one of these is the wicked problem. Now, the wicked problem is an open-ended problem, which also which often faces uh, medical practitioners. Now, TBL is too constrained to really explore problems like these. Some elements of the wicked problem can be explored in discussions surrounding the application phase, but actually, problem-based learning may be more adapted to these types of problems because it's much more of an open field in which you can accommodate wicked problems. Does team-based learning aid long-term retention? Well, this is very interesting. Incorporating TBL led to large gains in this particular study in factual knowledge over the short term. So short-term factual knowledge, there were large gains which were found, but these gains do not persist in the long-term. And in another study, long, uh, knowledge retention in the long term appears to be lower in TBL than in lecture-based learning. That's perhaps surprising. However, this is about knowledge retention, so about facts, factual knowledge. 
and knowledge retention of concepts and problem solving strategies, which primarily you would use, ideally you would use in team-based learning rather than factual knowledge. This hasn't been studied to date. In problem-based learning, conversely, long-term retention appears to be superior to lecture-based instruction, but short-term retention is slightly inferior. So again, very interesting, these findings. Um, so why are these short-term gains in team-based learning not transferred to long-term retention? Well, this might be due to a lack of distributed learning in TBL, which is found with lectures. And what we have here are two examples. When a student has a lecture, they then revise from the notes and then later revise from the notes again or from textbooks, ideally, that would be nice. And then they have the examination. So these several incidences, several episodes of revision is called distributed learning. But what you often find in TBL is that you have this TBL session and then there's nothing really to revise from. And then you go back to, you go straight to the examination so you don't have this distributed learning, which is found with lectures. But the problem is, is this doesn't really explain how PBL has long-term retention gains. More research is needed. So what is not known? Finally, what is not known about team-based learning? And this really are, is, is introducing some possible areas for research. Now, certainly my group is very much open to collaboration. So if, any, if anyone here wants to uh, uh, collaborate with us on any of these issues, any of these areas, please, please uh, contact us. Firstly, do we need permanent teams? In TBL, we have a permanent team often uh, persisting for the entire year. Does established group dynamics in long-term teams uh, uh, inhibit the activities of some team members? Perhaps it does, hasn't been studied. Do we actually need group consensus on responses in GRAT or TAP phases or the, the uh, application phases? Perhaps we don't. Perhaps it should just be a forum for discussion hasn't been investigated. Can we merge the readiness and application phases in some way? Potentially, yes. And in fact, something else we're working on here. Uh, can we use the readiness assurance phase only? Absolutely. Absolutely. It can be used only. By itself, this IRAT and GRAT are very robust as an educational tool. Online or technology-assisted TBL, what are the opportunities available? There are lots of reports of um, uh, people have conducted a lot of, a lot of papers. People have conducted uh, some, uh, an online version of TBL. But what can technology offer us? Rather than just trying to fit TBL into technology, what can technology offer us in respect of improving TBL? Um, does peer-to-peer -peer evaluation work in all cultures? Um, early evidence from, from some of my own studies show, no, it doesn't. And are there other methods of peer evaluation? This is something I'm working on in particular. Um, measuring collaboration in TBL, which is confidence judgments across both phases. How does the individual phase of readiness assurance pr uh, process impact collaborative cognition? Something which is pretty easy to study. So if anyone is interesting, interested in collaborating, I'm very happy to do so. And how does the macrocognition in Teams model work in team-based learning? Very little research has been conducted on how TBL represents different learning theories. And very little research has been conducted on the use of TBL in interprofessional education, which is another project which a group here is working on. Recommended reading. There are actually relatively few good books. This is a this is a good book, apart from that erroneous chapter, which I mentioned earlier. This is a good book. There are many research articles and reviews of varying quality. A lot of these research articles are just saying, we, we uh, tried out TBL in this particular course and it worked well. Nothing really in looking into the mechanisms which are driving TBL, not a lot. Um, there are no books on metacognition or cognition and very few research articles and almost no articles, just a few, just a handful of articles on metacognition and TBL to date. Thank you very much. I'm sure, sorry we uh, uh, stopped a little bit late, but we've got a couple of minutes for questions, I hope.